welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Sam De Silva. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm the chair of the BCS Law Specialist Group, and we're very pleased uh, to be hosting this event this evening. Uh, we've got a, a stellar lineup of, of speakers here, uh, and we couldn't have asked for a, a better sort of caliber of, of, of a team to speak on this issue. Most of you, unless you've sort of been living in the, a cave or maybe because of lockdown, uh, I'm sure you've heard of the, the post office scandal, uh, which is probably described as the, the biggest sort of largest miscarriage of justice in the English legal system. Uh, it, it, it was predicated on the basis that computers were reliable. So what we're going to be talking about, what the speakers are going to talk about is, you know, how that presumption came about and, you know, why that is not entirely appropriate. So uh, I will leave it up to Stephen Mason, who I've known for a many years, a good old sort of colleague and friend of uh, mine who sort of uh, helped facilitate this and, and brought all the speakers in, and he will introduce the speakers and, and give us a few observations and comments, and, you know, he will uh, progress this uh, webinar. If you've got any questions, uh, please do uh, put them in the chat room, and Penajada, who's our events coordinator, will be sort of uh, collating them, and then we'll be uh, presenting them to the to the panelists to answer them at the end of the session. So yeah, without further ado, Stephen. Thank you very much, Sam. That's very kind of you to introduce me. Um, it, I've got a, a great honor uh, this evening uh, to introduce, uh, brief, briefly introduce Paul Marshall and Flora Page, both barristers who represented Seema Misra and others in the Court of Appeal over the Post Office Horizon scandal, and they did that without charge. Um, and also um, Harold and Martin, who kindly checked my chapter on the presumption um, that computers are reliable in the practitioner tech in my protect, practitioner text over various um, editions. Uh, for anybody who's downloaded the fifth edition, uh, we have the Vignette uh, software is reliable and robust, and actually uh, those two um, uh, inc are included in, in that little bit um, as uh, two of the four the sage knowledge of the four learned professors. Um, uh, um, I, I'm not going to give any great detail about uh, either of our four speakers because uh, you've got a, a reasonably good uh, um, details of each speaker on the website. Very briefly, because of, of our time, um, Paul, Flora, Harold and Martin will speak one after the other and each hand will hand over to the other after they have finished. So Paul is going to set the scene with a high level instruction uh, and explanation of the post office horizon scandal, including what went wrong, the findings of Fraser J, uh, Mr. Justice Fraser, and the consequences. Flora is very good. It will consider the legal action, legal aid, and the covering of IT expertise, how the criminal process failed uh, regarding the burden of standard of proof. Um, and what it might mean for future cases. Um, and it was some time, hopefully, looking briefly at the prosecutor's fallacy. Harold will um, have a look at the trade-offs between uh, regarding error logs, um, but also, more importantly, um, for our exercise today, is to point out that this is not this problem is not unique to the post office. It includes the scandal of the Princess of Wales case uh, a few years ago, which is also um, Martin has written a very good article about that, which we published in the journal a couple of years ago. And Martin is going to finish off with the practical problems. Martin um, um, will look at why the lawyers need to know about the real nature of software and how the law deals with practicality and the need for practical solutions. So without any more ado, I'll hand over to Paul. Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you ever so much. Thank you very much, Stephen. What I'm going to say is uh, intended to put the post office scandal in context. Necessarily, it's at a very high level of abstraction, uh, and I can only mention a few points very briefly uh, and rather rapidly. In 1999, two very important things happened. First, a parliamentary select committee was told by three cabinet ministers that the Horizon computer system was insufficiently tested and that the proposed scheme for its use for state benefits through the post office presented the risk of a, quotes, fiasco. The project was shelved with wasted expenditure of about £720 million to the taxpayer. But the committee was told that the post office would benefit by the Horizon system, facilitating the computerization of its paper accounting system at 17,000 branch post offices. 
The second was that Parliament accepted the recommendations by the Law Commission that safeguards for documentary evidence produced by computers in both civil and criminal proceedings should be removed. Such evidence in the future should be accepted without the party relying upon it, being required to show that the computer from which the evidence was derived was working properly at the relevant time. That applied unless there was some basis for doubting the reliability of the source. The post office horizon scandal correlates exactly with the period since the, abo the abolition of those statutory protections. In practice, that comes close to reversing the burden of proof as it does in the uh, post office scandal. There is an old saw about uh, computers with which you'll be familiar, garbage in, garbage out. The same can be said of the English legal system. That may be amusing. It is not in the least amusing if the consequence of the garbage in question for you, if you happen to be a woman with young children, is that you are committed to prison for 15 months on the basis of a charge of theft based on incomplete, unreliable, misleading evidence derived from a computer system that is in fact riddled with undisclosed bugs and software issues. Seema Misra was eight weeks pregnant when imprisoned for theft following a trial before a jury in Guildford Crown Court in 2010. At different stages of her prosecution, she had asked three different judges on four different occasions to order disclosure of Horizon computer records to be given to her by the post office. Each of those judges dismissed her applications. The post office affected to be helpful in offering to give disclosure if Mrs. Misra could only point to the particular Horizon problem to which the disclosure might be directed. She could not, she had no idea. All she knew is that she had repeated problems reconciling her cash balances. The last application at her trial included the formal submission by her counsel to the judge that she could not have a fair trial without further horizon disclosure. The trial judge disagreed and said that there was already a great deal of technical disclosure and that Mrs. Misra could have a fair trial without the post office giving any more. Part of the prosecution case against her was that if as Mrs. Misra contended, there was a problem with the Horizon computer system that would be obvious to a terminal operator. There was no evidence that Mrs. Misra had taken any actual cash. The entire prosecution case turned on documented so-called, quotes, shortfalls, that is to say, discrepancies on the Horizon system. The prosecutor in his speech to the jury was in good company. A quarter of a century ago, Lord Hoffman, an influential judge widely regarded as immensely clever, made a statement that has gained astonishingly widespread acceptance amongst lawyers and judges. In 1997, Lord Hoffman, in a case called Director of Public Prosecutions and McEwen and Jones, expressed his entirely atypically silly opinion that it is notorious that one needs no expertise in electronics to be able to know whether a computer is working properly, unquote. Another indisputably bright judge, Lord Justice Lloyd, in the Queen and Governor of Penton, uh, Pr Pentonville Prison, ex parte Osman in 1990, had said, where a lengthy computer printout contains no internal evidence of malfunction and is retained by a bank or stockbroker as part of its records, it may be legitimate to infer that the computer which made the record was functioning correctly. Lee Castleton was subject to civil proceedings brought by the post office in 2006 for a shortfall of £26,000. The High Court trial judge concluded, despite Mr Castleton's protest that he'd been meticulously careful, that the Horizon system was working perfectly properly and the cause of the losses was Mr Castleton's ineptitude as a postmaster. There was no expert evidence at all. Instead, the judge accepted the Horizon printouts and noted, following Lord Justice Lloyd's lead, that on the face of it, there was nothing wrong with the numbers on the computer records. He awarded costs of £310,000 against Mr. Castleton in favour of the post office. That resulted in Mr. Castleton's bankruptcy. He lost his investment in his business and he and his family were reduced to penury. In 2019, Mr. Justice Fraser gave his exhaustive judgment on, on the preliminary horizon issues in group litigation brought by some 550 claimants. 20 years after the Horizon computer system had been introduced by the post office, after hundreds of postmasters and others had been prosecuted for theft and other offences of dishonesty, or like Lee Castleton had been subject to civil claims by the post office or other legal processes, the judge concluded that it was possible for bugs, errors or defects of the nature alleged by the claimants to have the potential both to cause apparent or alleged discrepancies or shortfalls relating to sub-postmaster branch, branch accounts or transactions, 
and also to undermine the reliability of Horizon accurately to process and to record transactions as alleged by the claimants. He added, I accept the claimant submissions that, in terms of likelihood, there was a significant and material risk on occasion of branch accounts being affected in the way alleged by the claimants by bugs, errors, and defects. So, 13 years after Mr. Castleton was ruined by a claim brought against him by the post office, and nine years after Mrs. Misra's prosecution, Mr. Justice Fraser found that Horizon had a propensity to cause shortfalls and errors similar to those experienced that they said that they had had. The post office group litigation is thought to have incurred costs in the total sum of around 150 million pounds. In the very brief time I'm given, I will rather didactically make three statements that ought to be taken on board by both lawyers and those involved in the IT industry. To one or other of those groups, at least one of these propositions will be as sucking eggs is to proverbial grandmothers. First, with virtually no exceptions, computer software coding includes errors. The error rate or density tends to diminish with the importance of the particular system, but is rarely, if ever, eliminated. Such errors cause almost all software to have the propensity to fail in given circumstances, and such failures may well not be obvious or apparent. That may sound like a blinding glimpse of the obvious to this audience, but this and its implications have eluded a great number of judges and lawyers, including, as I have said, some judges of distinction. Second, the question is always, as Mr. Justice Fraser records in his judgment, in any given circumstances, what documented evidence is there of failure? The primary source of such evidence in maintained systems such as Horizon will be the known error log and records of fixes and patches. The next question is, whether any given complaint correlates with records of errors and failures. That is not exhaustive because actual faults and errors may yet be documented, but it is a start. It is remarkable that in the post office case in 2018 and 2019, the post office's legal team initially questioned whether the known error log for Horizon might exist at all. When it was found to exist, the post office challenged its relevance. When it was found to exist and be relevant, the post office denied that it was in its power to disclose it. In fact, it had a contractual right to the log, as Mr. Justice Fraser slightly sardonically pointed out. The takeaway for those in the industry is to be upfront and helpful with error records. There is now likely to be a long investigation of post office personnel and also possibly their lawyers as to who knew what about various bugs and errors and records and when. That is likely to be painful. In short, don't play games with the disclosure of documents. The post office played an enormous game with disclosure and it blew up spectacularly. Most of Mr. Justice Fraser's analysis proceeds on the basis of documented errors hitherto undisclosed. My third point is a point I made in the talk I gave to the University of Law. It is a point that it is easy for lawyers to lose sight of. A piece of paper with writing on it is not evidence until it is explained what it is and that if the writing is a statement, someone is able to vouch the accuracy or truth of that statement. All too often in the Horizon tragedy, lawyers and judges assumed that because documents emanated from a computer, then what the document stated was in some objective sense, accurate and true. The forensic investigation firm Second Sight, that in response to parliamentary pressure was appointed to review the operation of Horizon in 2012, raised the possibility that unattributed funds that appeared in post offices unallocated suspense accounts might in truth be the balancing sums for the apparent shortfalls for which the post office prosecuted its postmasters. That was not a suggestion that received a warm reception by the post office and Second Sight got sacked. But as Professor Peter Ladkin pointed out in a recent discussion between some of us, it remains a curiosity that merely because of the interposition of the Horizon system in transactions as a sort of magic box, ordinary principles of accounting appeared to go out of the window with the post office with the horizon system and with the courts. Postmasters routinely contested the fact of transactions and the post office was unable when challenged to prove end-to-end -end transactional data. It merely asserted that the horizon system was reliable, a contention that lawyers, judges and juries were too willing to uncritically accept. The consequence stands as the most extensive miscarriage of justice in English legal history. In April 2021, the Court of Appeal quashed Mrs. Misra's conviction, together with 38 others, holding that the post office had engaged in conduct that amounted to a serious abuse of the process of the court 
that threatened to subvert the integrity of the criminal justice system, an extraordinary and unusual finding. One of the reasons for Mrs. Misra's conviction being quashed was that she did not receive a fair trial because the post officer had withheld from her disclosure of Horizon records. A final point I'll make is that some years ago, a very famous distinguished and influential medical expert gave statistical evidence about the probability of babies dying suddenly and without previous symptoms. Courts routinely deferred to the expert in concluding that given the alleged improbability of death occurring naturally, the defendant must, by the acts alleged against them, have killed the child. Eventually, time was called on that by exposing both the statistics and the reasoning to be flawed. In the post office scandal at Mrs. Misra's trial, the jury was invited by the judge to infer from the number of post offices that appear to operate without a problem, whether Mrs. Misra's account of the problems she had experienced was truthful. It is in my view unfortunate that the Court of Appeal did not consider in the many appeals the directions given by judges to juries in connection with Horizon evidence. There is a good deal still to be learned. Thank you for listening. I'll now hand over to Flora, uh, who uh, was uh, my, my junior uh, for some of the uh, appellants in, in the Court of Appeal. Um, I should simply uh, add by way of uh, introduction, she has the distinction of being the only member of the criminal bar uh, to have agreed with my perception that the what, what is called the second category of abuse of process uh, um, by the post office uh, was a, a viable and proper ground of appeal to pursue um, uh, in, in uh, uh, unlike uh, all the other uh, appellants, counsel and lawyers, uh, and indeed most obviously contrary to the um, position of the um, prosecution, uh, the Crown that is. Um, Flora, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Paul. Yes, yeah, so my uh, talk is going to be about how this case fits into the criminal justice system. And there are really two features of the criminal courts, which made them a very dangerous place for Horizon Evidence to make an entrance. The first is that there is a general lack of understanding of STEM disciplines. Uh, lawyers in general and criminal lawyers in particular, will often fight shy of any evidence involving maths or science or IT. And as Paul has already alluded to, statistics is a particular sore spot. Um, and one of the issues which uh, has come up and, and already been noted in the Sally Clark case is something that we have come to know or come to speak of as the prosecutor's fallacy. It's a logical problem which this audience would readily understand, but which many lawyers struggle with. Uh, it is most commonly looked at in the context of DNA matches. Uh, let's assume that there's a DNA match which leads to an arrest and there's nothing else to connect the suspect to the scene where the criminal's DNA was found. Now, um, the prosecutor's fallacy is to equate the likelihood of the suspect being picked out of the data set at random with the likelihood of the suspect being innocent. And that is it, that, that fallacy was illustrated in the uh, case which Paul has alluded to, the Sally Clark case. Um, in that case, a woman who had suffered the rare and tragic fate of having two babies die of sudden death, sudden infant death syndrome, um, suffered the uh, even um, adding insults to injury and the miscarriage of justice that came about when Professor Meadows' evidence for the prosecution equated these two things together. He stated that the, uh, the chances of there being two cases of sudden infant death in the same family were one in 73 million and he directly equated that with there being only one in 73 million chance that uh, Sally Clark was innocent of killing her babies. Now, first of all, he took no account of the environmental and biological factors that may make a second death more likely if you've suffered a first. 
Second, he took no account of the rarity of double infanticide. So in other words, the rarity of the alternative proposition that she was guilty. But third and most fundamentally, he failed to understand that you cannot equate the statistical likelihood an event of an event occurring at random with the statistical likelihood of a particular defendant being guilty of a particular crime. Now, uh, it took a long time for the criminal justice system to recognize the miscarriage of justice inflicted on Sally Clark and the scars on her were simply too deep. And that brings us back to the post office scandal where the same can be said, and I'm afraid for very similar reasons as Paul has already alluded to. Because when the post office brought theft prosecutions on the back of horizon shortfalls, it was the prosecutor's fallacy all over again. The post office says Horizon is accurate and reliable, and from this they concluded that the chances of Horizon producing inaccurate figures is small, and therefore when Horizon says that money is missing from this post office branch, the chances of this sub postmaster being innocent of theft is also small. Now, a bit like Meadows in the Clark case, the first problem with that reasoning was that it was resting on faulty foundations. Horizon was not accurate and reliable. But second, it fell into the trap of equating the chances of Horizon going wrong at random with the chances of a particular sub postmaster being innocent of theft. So all the post office did in mounting their prosecutions was to present Horizon figures, rely on a bland assertion that Horizon was a reliable system, and then suggest that the sub postmaster needed to either accept their guilt or prove their innocence. When put like this, it's relatively easy for a criminal lawyer to see that that is a reversal of the burden of proof. We are all presumed innocent until proven guilty. And it is not enough for a prosecutor to present evidence of a rare event occurring and then say the person connected to the event must be guilty of making the event happen unless they can prove otherwise. The prosecution is supposed to prove that a particular person has caused an event, not just say the event is rare. The awful thing is Paul and I appear to have been the first lawyers to identify this fundamental problem with the post office prosecutions. We made this argument convincingly in our grounds of appeal on behalf of Seema Misra and our other clients. And in the end, it was the lead reason for the Court of Appeal finding resoundingly in favour of our clients. But for 10 or 15 years, hundreds of cases had come through the criminal justice system without anyone apparently identifying this fundamental problem with the way the post office were relying upon the horizon evidence. Now this goes deeper than the evidential presumption, which the panel will speak about and which Paul has already alluded to. And I have to say, few criminal lawyers even know that there is an evidential presumption that computers are reliable. I doubt it was referred to across those many hundreds of cases many times. It didn't need to be, because the lawyers and judges were already inculcated with the idea that machines were infallible. They didn't think to question them, and they didn't even think to apply a much more well-known presumption, that is the presumption of innocence. So that uh, um, failing of understanding of um, STEM-based disciplines was a, a huge problem in the criminal justice system. And the other one I can express much more briefly uh, is a, a lack of money. There have been cuts on cuts on cuts in the criminal justice system. And this sits on top of the first problem because where we lawyers don't have expertise, whether it be in IT or in any other areas, we hire it in. But the trouble is that legally aided clients have to get permission from the legal aid authority before they can hire an expert witness in say IT. Likewise, the police have to keep a very close eye on budgets when they hire experts to help prosecutions. So these government agencies very, keep a very close eye on the rates of pay for experts. So unfortunately, helping to keep the criminal justice system grounded in good computer science 
is not lucrative work for people whose skills are in high demand. Now, these twin problems continue lack of basic understanding of STEM disciplines and lack of money to hire in genuine expertise. And as we develop more and more powerful ways of using IT, this becomes of ever greater concern. So I will leave you with just one example. There could be many, many others, but this is one that has struck me recently. Facial recognition technology, I gather, is much disputed territory. Uh, the tech giants are spending huge R&D budgets on developing it, but also there are serious uh, disputes and disagreements over its capabilities, its limitations, the way forward for it, how it should develop, what the constraints should be, etc. But meanwhile, the Met Police, with nothing like the Silicon Valley budget, is just pressing on because they want to use the vast CCTV network across our capital to identify criminals. Laudable perhaps, but the pitfalls are obvious. I'm very much afraid that there will be hubris, which will lead to misidentifications and miscarriages of justice. And then, just like with the post office, there will be institutional denial. So we must all try to be the eyes and ears that prevent that from happening again. So um, with that thought, over to you perhaps, Harold. Thank you, Flora and Paul. Um, I want to start off by expressing my admiration, in fact, awe to all of the sub postmasters who've been, been through the mill. It's been horrendous. Um, uh, Flora said something, uh, lots of people think computers are infallible and in many ways that's at the root of the horizon problems that people think computers are infallible, uh, the presumption that computer evidence is correct, it's built into the law, it goes throughout our society, everybody's excited about computers, um, I, I, I've got an iPhone and I want the next iPhone because, well, um, Apple convinced me that they're infallible, that's how the computer industry works it's selling stuff and then of course horizon has got bugs and then people say well horizon is an exception and it's a special case so the first thing i want to say very clearly is horizon is a typical example of what computers are like computers have bugs and they have an enormous negative impact on all sorts of people in all walks of life that goes unnoticed and sometimes is disastrous for those people as it clearly was for over 700 people in, in the Horizon case. I've got a couple of examples just to emphasize this. Have you heard about the childcare allowance case in Holland? Right, that, that's interesting because the Dutch government uh, passed legislation which was implemented by a computer and the computer systems uh, found 26,000 families were being fraudulent. And those families ended up with financial obligations to repay money that they had never taken from the Dutch government. And it was such a mess, the entire Dutch government resigned in January. And there are all sorts of messes in that and details. It's, it's as complicated a case as Horizon, but it shows that Horizon is not a special case. Holland had a, a thing, on, in fact, on a larger scale, and the government took responsibility for it and resigned en masse. You can look it up. There's pages of stuff about it on the, on the internet, of course. The second example I'll take is a case where, where I got involved as an expert witness. This is the Princess of Wales. The Princess of Wales is a hospital uh, in Bridgend in Wales, and they had a problem that led them to suspending 73 nurses. And out of those 73 nurses, they selected five to prosecute. And as, as you no doubt know, that before a prosecution starts, the defence and the prosecution meet to see if there's any way of resolving issues without wasting the court's time. And I, I was at some of those meetings and the police described there were 73 nurses who'd all deleted patient data 
and uh, the the way the the nurses did it this was a criminal offense and uh, i said you you might have one nurse who's a proverbial witch but you don't get 73 and you don't get 73 all doing the same thing and i said have you thought that there might be somebody in the back office who's got a grudge against nurses uh, or have you thought there might be a cyber attack or have you thought there might be a bug you know there, there are all sorts of other explanations which account for 73 people apparently doing the same bad things and the prosecution said they're all in it together and so it went to court and uh, after three weeks of court uh the prosecution called abbott abbott was the company sort of the equivalent the fujitsu equivalent for this case abbott are an international company who make medical devices and the chief engineer abbott was called to court and while he was being cross-examined, he happened to mention he'd been to the hospital. And I took the defence barrister in front of me and said, ask him what he did. And uh, he explained he went to the hospital and did things. I said, what, what date did he do it? And he was, and he said, by the 12th of April, I think. And I took the barrister in front of me and I said, there's a large glitch in the data on the 12th of April. Ask him what he did. And uh, the whole case unraveled at that point because it turned out the hospital had asked him to tidy up the data. And that's exactly what he did on the 12th of April, which created the impression that the nurses, because this is what, how the computer recorded it, the nurses' data had disappeared. So the hospital just assumed the nurses were responsible for the data disappearing 73 times. Whereas, in fact, it was a single engineer that the hospital had called in and he had, un I don't know, uh, let, let me be charitable, he had unwittingly deleted the data, tidying it up. But it created the impression that everybody misunderstood to such an extent that they were more persuaded that the nurses were criminals than there could have been a much simpler explanation. So uh, I think it's astonishing how we think as Flora said, computers are infallible, and we think that so, so much uh, that we're prepared to prosecute hundreds of people, or in, in Holland, 26,000 people, or in the Princess of Wales, 73 nurses, and some of them lost their jobs subsequently, because as with the Princess of Wales, uh, the Horizon case, they'd been persuaded to plead guilty because there was overwhelming computer evidence against them, and they had no way of refuting it. Like, can you remember what you did uh, on the 1st of January at 11 a.m. this year? Well, no, I don't know what I did then. Well, you deleted a lot of data. That's what the computer says. Why don't you plead guilty? That's how it worked. So uh, I'm going to say computer bugs are everywhere. Uh, I imagine everybody here uses Microsoft software. Have you read the EULAs that come with it? The EULA is the end user license agreement that when you start using Microsoft software, this is what you agree to. And uh, I've printed out a bit of the EULA for Excel and uh, Excel, Word and Outlook, they're all, they're all the same basically, but they run to hundreds of pages. Excel says, you mustn't use it for commercial purposes. You mustn't use it for nonprofit purposes and you mustn't use it for revenue generating activities. That's what you have agreed to when you use Excel. And uh, you might wonder uh, why Microsoft say you shouldn't use it for all these purposes. Well, the answer is it's got bugs and they don't want you to see them because you have agreed that you won't use it for these purposes. And the next sentence, you will review these terms, which you've agreed to, and you agree to do so is written into the terms that you probably have never read. That is Microsoft, a leading manufacturer, and the, the you know, Apple and Samsung and everybody else has very similar end user license agreements. Those are the companies saying these systems have bugs, which we do not want to be responsible for. That's essentially what Fujitsu and Abbott were doing uh, with the post office and the Princess of Wales. So, 
I'd love to carry on indefinitely because I'm cross about this because of the lack of competence in the people who build these systems in the first place. They introduce bugs. We all know computer systems have bugs, but the people who build them don't test the systems. They don't use formal engineering methods and so on to make sure they're as good as they possibly can be. They're basically selling rubbish. And they put in contracts with their users that say, don't use the system for what you bought it for. Uh, and you must review these terms and you agree to do so. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a mess. And since I started to rant, I think I should hand over to Martin at this point, who's much more balanced than I am. Thank you very much, Harold. Well, my, my task, my, my self-imposed task is, is surprisingly to actually um, rationalize and, and support the presumption that, that the law makes, whether explicitly or implicitly, that computers are reliable. Um, I mean, we, we know as, as technical people that, that um, as, as Harold has said, and, and as others have said, that uh, computer systems contain a lot of bugs. You know, that there, there have been experiments carried out. Um, there have been reviews of, of lots of software by academics. And if you're world-class, then, then you make maybe one defect in, well, a few hundred lines of code, but that really is world-class. It's, it's much closer to normal programming behavior that, that you're introducing a defect into code in about one, one every 50 lines of, of code. And we also know that um, even heroic amounts of testing, because of the, the number of different paths that exist through, through large software systems, even heroic amounts of testing will only actually identify about half those bugs. And, and there are academic papers that, that back all this up and you know, we, we can provide references if, if need be. And the consequence is that there are a, a huge number of defects in, in all the software systems that we use, but those systems work astonishingly well almost all of the time. And therefore it's not surprising that um, firstly, um, judges and, and juries believe that uh, computer systems are, are reliable enough that they pass the burden of, burden of proof and, and the evidence that comes out of them is acceptable. But also, it's actually necessary for the functioning of the courts that that assumption is, is routine, because without it, you'd have the, a huge amount of disclosure that needed to be done, and you'd open the door to uh, a lot of, of fishing expeditions, a lot of challenges of um, systems where it, it just becomes the obvious thing to do. If somebody accuses you of, of doing something on the basis of computer evidence or the, the behavior of a machine, whether that, that's a, the horizon system or, or a, a breathalyzer or a speed camera, it would become routine for you to, to challenge the evidence, to demand disclosure of all the code and all the error logs and all the details of, of everything that had ever gone wrong with it and, and all the architectural decisions that have been made and, and all the tests have been run and so on. Um, and it would clog up the courts, giving you access to all that data and it would be impossibly expensive and impossibly time consuming. And when, the um, Police and Criminal Evidence Act removed temporarily, as it turned out, the uh, uh, presumption that, that computer evidence was reliable, that computers were functioning perfectly at, at the appropriate time. Um, those practicalities became real and the difficulties that arose in the criminal justice system led the Law Commission to uh, recommend reintroduction of that presumption in, into the law in, in later legislation. So as, as technical people, I think we've got a duty to recognize that, that the assumptions that are made by the courts are not just stupid people not understanding what we do about software, but they're the practical necessity in order to be able to, to use the uh, evidence that comes from computers, which turns up in a vast number of criminal and civil cases, 
in a way that is actually in the main appropriate for the job that, that needs to be done. So yeah. there's a dilemma at the heart of the computer evidence problem. And a, a group of us, in, including the, the people who are, who are speaking to you today, have written a paper proposing what ought to be done about it. And essentially, um, what, what we suggest is that there is a practical amount of disclosure that ought to be made and that would enable the uh, problem that Flora has identified of the, the burden of proof being reversed uh, to, to be taken away and put back where it belongs in many of the appropriate cases where, where that burden of proof it simply leads, leads to uh, injustices. And, and in essence, what we've proposed is that if you're going to rely on the evidence from a computer-based system, then you ought to disclose, firstly, um, what evidence you've got that it is, is a reliable system. In other words, has it been developed professionally? Is there the evidence that it's been developed professionally? And secondly, um, most certainly, what, what errors are known about the system? What, what um, are the, the, known, the logs of known errors? What, what has been um, fixed in, and, and disclosed in, in uh, release notices, for example? What steps have been taken to repair the errors that have been detected? And what effort are you putting in to make sure that those errors aren't being reintroduced? Are, are you carrying out um, regression testing and so on? In any system that deserves to be trusted, that sort of evidence, that sort of set of documents, and, and I merely mentioned just a small subset of them, will be readily available because they're part of the normal professional process of developing a system and of maintaining it, um, upgrading it, fixing errors in it, and so on. And so they will all be completely readily available on file. They'll be uh, accessible to the people who are managing the system because they're, they're working documents for keeping the system going. And uh, therefore the disclosure of them won't cost a lot of money, won't be difficult. And, and because they will have been being managed effectively, they will be properly indexed and properly available and easy for an expert to look at and to, to advise the court as to whether uh, on the face of it, this looks like a well-managed system that it's, it's reasonable to trust. Now, if those documents aren't available, then the presumption has to be that, that the system is, is not actually a trustworthy system, that you can't rely on the output from it to any high standard of, of proof. And similarly, if there are uh, errors that are disclosed as known errors, whether they've been corrected or not, that um, could perhaps have led to the particular incident which is at the heart of the case that's being brought or the claim that's being brought in the civil courts, then again, the burden of proof ought to go back to the people who are relying on that evidence to demonstrate that in this particular case, that, that previous error, that existing error wasn't at fault and that it, it is entirely reasonable to rely on the evidence from the computer system that, and, and to believe that it was functioning correctly in this instance. So I, I think by that sort of approach, we can get back to a sensible way that is practical for the courts to operate, and yet which avoids the egregious um, miscarriages of justice that can occur if, if you, you put forward the, the kind of challenge that, that Flora has been describing. Mm. And the, the prosecutor's fallacy is, is just a failure of conditional probability of somebody not understanding that, that the probability of A given B is not the same as the probability of B given A. You know, the, the probability that, that you're pregnant just because you're a woman is not the same as the probability that you're a woman just because you're pregnant. Those, those are two entirely different probabilities. And it's a, a, a simple result of, of you know, 
Bayesian logic 101 to be able to distinguish between those and, and to draw the appropriate conclusions. The courts need practical technology and, and the ability to use it effectively and to be guided by experts. And it should not need to be expensive to do that. So if, if you're interested in the proposals that we've put forward, you'll find them in the paper that, that we have published. It's called um, Recommendations for the Probity of Computer Evidence. And it's in Digital Evidence and Electronic Signature Law Review 2021. Uh, and you'll find free download online. And you should have been given a set of resources which include the references that will enable you to, to find that paper and other related papers. So I, I implore the lawyers amongst you to recognize the importance of this issue and the technical people to recognize that, that the law, lawyers need your assistance in determining what can be effectively disclosed without raising the kind of costs and delays that make the administration of the law simply impractical. So let's work together to come up with, with a decent solution. And before I hand back to, to Stephen, which is my next job, I'm going to ask Carol to, to intervene since I think he, he wants to say something. <laughs> oh, thank you very much, Martin. Uh, I thought what you said was uh, inspiring and really powerful. And I'm afraid while you're talking, I thought of a new idea that we haven't discussed previously. And uh, for the sake of, I don't know, fun, I'll call it Thimbleby's rule. Uh, when a human gives evidence in a court, their credentials are established and they're cross-examined and sort of they're teased apart. And uh, that doesn't happen with computer evidence. And the problem is, how should it happen? So this is where Thimbleby's rule comes in. Computer systems are no better than their programmers. And programmers are not very good. So what you do, you go to Fujitsu, you bring in some programmers and say, what are your credentials to allow you to program reliably? And the answer is that there are no credentials that programmers in any area of endeavor are required to have. It's a, uh, that needs fixing. The British Computer Society needs to have different sorts of programming credentials. Like if you're an accountant, you have to become a chartered accountant before you can practice. But if you want to build a computer system like Excel, which all accountants use, you don't need any qualifications whatsoever. That needs fixing, but yes, if it, it does, if 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 if, you, if, you, if, you if, if when recognise that, that there is a, a practicality issue associated with that, I mean, at the moment, if you if you were to do that on a routine basis in the courts, no computer evidence would ever be admitted. <laughs> and, and on that, I'm going to have <laughs> to hand back to wrap up the questions. I'm fairly sure you've got some opinions it's, on that. Like, 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 like most big problems, this is going to take years to fix. Agreed. And that is one of the things that needs doing in those decades that is going to take to fix it. We need proper qualifications for programmers, which we don't have yet. Thank, thank you very much, Martin. Thank you, Harold. Um, um, one of our problems is that we have ministers of every government encouraging children to program as well. So when a child starts reprogramming your life support system from their bedroom into the hospital, uh, do be wary. Uh, now, I hope I get your name correct, um, Panagotia. Um, who is the um, Law um, Secretary for the British Computer Society, will we'll now uh, take questions and will field them. So, Patagonia, uh, uh, shall I hand over to you to start with before I finish off? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, there have been a lot of questions in the chat. I have been uh, trying to gather them because there are also many comments and responses to the comments. But uh, I, just starting with uh, the questions, there was uh, one uh, early now uh, from uh, Alan Day uh, when um, uh, the, uh, our first speaker was speaking. Where in the prosecution's private post office investigates assembled evidence and uh, was a significant beneficiary. So he, he, 
uh, Alan, they also responded yes, but this would be a question to Paul. He was the first uh, speaker, so it was during Paul's uh, speech. I'm, I'm quite happy to have a little bit of a tilt at that. Um, one of the things that happened after the um, after the Horizon uh, judgment, the, the, the two principal judgments of Mr. Justice Fraser was that the um, Ministry of Justice uh, uh, established, well, the Ministry of Justice Select Committee undertook a review of private prosecutions because it, uh, well, specifically the Criminal Cases Review Commission raised a question about uh, how satisfactory private prosecutions uh, were and the constraints and restraints upon them. Um, the, um, the committee in due course um, came to the conclusion that there ought to be greater uh, statutory uh, control of private prosecutions. Um, the principal and obvious reason being that um, as, as um, uh, illustrated or vividly shown by the, the post office prosecutions, uh, the post office assumed three different roles simultaneously or sequentially really of, of being um, the victim, the uh, investigator, uh, and then the prosecuting authority. Each of those roles had potential uh, conflicting cross currents uh, and to merge them in one entity um, plainly um, gave um, incentives for all sorts of, or created all sorts of potential problems, which manifested themselves uh, in the um, horizon cases. And in a sense, the best illustration of how that happened and what its consequences were, um, are to be found in the Court of Appeal judgments and the sort of things that were being recorded by the post office in the course of its investigations um, prior to um, trial and indeed that sometimes after after trial um, the very famous document a well-known document um, by one of the post office's solicitors um, after Mrs. Misra's uh, trial in particular where there, there's a, a sort of crowing email circulated to all the post office um, staff and lawyers about how the post office managed to destroy quotes I think um, every single one of the defences uh, uh, advanced by Mrs. Uh, Misra, and, and most particularly that this ought to act as a disincentive for quotes uh, others jumping on the post uh, on the uh, horizon bashing bandwagon. Um, so the the justice committee concluded that there ought to be greater constraints or restrictions again uh, on uh, private prosecutions. But I suspect the reality is that uh, in the nature of parliamentary business. Um, that's unlikely to happen, uh, certainly in the near future, uh, if at all. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, the next question uh, comes from uh, Peter C. Bell. Uh, again, about the post office case. Uh, one question is whether the people who knew that the system was not reliable told anyone that this was the case. Uh, separately, the private investigation and prosecution teams may well have suspected that the system was not as reliable as it had been made out to be, but they were rewarded for successful prosecutions and were not incentivized to question to deeply the whole basis of their prosecutions. So this was a, a, a placement by Peter. Uh, I don't know if um, uh, one of our speakers I, would like I, to make a comment. Yeah, sure, I, I mean, I think. Just that, yes. Um, I think the uh, the people who knew that the system was unreliable. Um, were in some cases coming to court and lying about it and saying that it was reliable. That was the, one of the major problems. Um, and I think that comes back to an issue which uh, both Harold and Martin have touched on, which is how do you, um, how do you analyze the credibility of experts who come to talk about IT in court? And one of the problems with the way it happened in the Horizon case was that the experts who came to speak for the prosecution were Fujitsu employees who had been responsible for creating the system. So they were, there was no independence there. There was no check or, or, or sort of uh, balance against the idea that the system may not have been reliable. They just came along and spoke about their own system and said how good and reliable it was. Um, and, and there are, 
uh, now some investigations being undertaken by uh, the police to uh, the instigation of Mr Justice Fraser as to whether they should be being prosecuted for um, crimes of perjury and conspiracy to pervert the course of justice and so forth. So we'll see what comes of that in due course. But um, there, is, there is, I think, a real problem around establishing the, the right credentials for people to come to court and talk about uh, uh, the, the IT systems. Can I just jump in there and add a, add a comment um, very briefly? I was I was going to make a little bit of a digression on this and what I said, but I I, I didn't do so. That there, there are plainly two two separate problems here, and the post office um, scandal, if you like, um, is made much more complicated by the fact that there are, on the one hand, self evidently big questions about understanding computer data and computer evidence on the part of lawyers and the courts and how to manage disclosure. That's one aspect of it. An entirely discreet and separate aspect, which really aggravated that as an existing problem, uh, was intentional wrongdoing or apparent intentional wrongdoing, uh, he says very carefully, on the part of um, various um, uh, employees uh, uh, of the post office uh, and uh, Fujitsu. And what I was going to mention, and it's in a sense a direct answer to this question, is one of the remarkable things about Mrs. Misra's trial is that, as I mentioned, one of the, the, the prosecuting uh, counsel in both opening and closing submissions said, um, any postmaster in Mrs. Misra's position who had a problem with uh, Horizon would know about having a problem with Horizon. Now, a month before that, before her prosecution in September 2010, there was a high level meeting between very senior representatives of both Fujitsu and the post office in which a, a particular bug called the receipts and payments mismatch bug, which is discussed at great length by Mr. Justice Fraser in his Horizon Issues judgment. That bug was discussed and it, what, what was said about it was that the problem with it was that there would be, as the name suggests, a mismatch between receipts and payments, which was apparent on the post office's stroke Fujitsu's servers, but would not be apparent to a postmaster. Now, the remarkable thing about that is that the one of the most senior Fujitsu engineers was present at that meeting and indeed authored a report about it, which was subsequently circulated. That engineer gave evidence at Mrs. Misra's trial against her of the reliability of Horizon. That is what gave rise to Mr. Justice Fraser in due course referring that uh, individual to the Director of Pro Public Prosecutions. But what's remarkable about it, another aspect that's remarkable about it, is that in his judgment, Mr. Justice Fraser describes the receipts and payments mismatch bug as, quotes, having been kept secret by the post office. The other aspect of it, another remarkable aspect of it, is that this particular bug was in fact picked up in discussions with Second Sight in the mediation investigation stage uh, way back in 2013. And it was that that uh, was partly responsible for triggering uh, the 20, well, there was an important part of the Second Sight interim report, which triggered the famous Clark advice. But at that point, I'll shut up. Thank you very much, Flora and Paul. Uh, the next question comes from uh, Phil uh, Stanley to everyone. Uh, so where the PO ever asked or required to disclose how many prosecutions had occurred or were they able um, to deny that the pattern was emerging? Um, I think Flora responded to Phil, but uh, the, the question is, if they were required to disclose how many prosecutions had occurred. Um, well, I, yes, I and, did reply. Uh, um, um, I did reply in the chat just to say that I'm, I'm afraid they weren't. Okay, then they, were, they weren't required I, I, I to disclose. Them. Okay, uh, indeed, uh, Flora replied. So I will uh, uh, go further. Um, there were also some questions raised later uh, from Andy Clark. Uh, from what I see, one clear difference between the post office approach and that of, uh, for example, banks 
seem to be that they appear not to entertain the concept of a true budget, where the organization accepts that there will be losses to fraud, either deliberate or inadvertent. Does anyone know if this is the case? If so, what was the background to that position? Did they prosecute all SPMs or shortfalls? This was uh, Andy Clark. Any any of our speakers would like to respond to Andy? I'm not I'm not aware, and I doubt um, any of us are aware of there being a fraud budget. It, 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 I take that to mean a sort of a write-off, an idea that a certain amount of money will be lost to fraud. Did, did, are you aware of that happening, Paul? No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I mean, I I I, I suspect there may, may well have been, but I mean, it's not something that's come across my my uh, horizons. Okay, thank you. The next question from uh, Liz Evans. Uh, there is an issue of proportionality in the lower courts. How practical would it be for the type of disclosure that Martin proposes to be delivered in a speeding case when uh, Mr. Loophole's defense is mounted? So this was uh, while Martin was speaking. I don't know if yeah, Martin so wishes to take that or something. I, I think it, it is practical um, because I, I think in in um, cases where where the systems are um, the, the kind of things that are going to be challenged, um, you know, but perhaps just just because somebody's hoping to get off, you know, thing, things like a, a breathalyzer prosecution, uh, it would be perfectly reasonable to to make the the uh, data that has been disclosed publicly available on on a website so that it becomes trivially easy for anybody else who, who makes that challenge to get access to, to or to be given uh, a pointer to, to that data and then they can then follow it up and it shouldn't occupy a lot of court time doing mm -hmm. that. I think there are practical issues in, in um, cases that involve larger um, pieces of software or, or um, in particular proprietary software because I think we, we will run into um, confidentiality issues about um, detailed lists of, of bugs and standards that were followed and so on. And I think as technicians, as, as technical people, we need to see if we can find a solution to that because we need to make the use of computer evidence practical in court without creating these sorts of of difficulties in the legal system that lead to these egregious miscarriages of justice. And because we understand computer evidence and computers, it, it really behoves us as, as technical people to help the lawyers to get this right. Yeah. And it, it's not enough to just keep saying, you know, software's full of bugs and therefore you shouldn't believe computer evidence because that, that would stop us doing so many things that are actually vital to the way that we run society today. Mm. You'd, you'd expect something like a, a breathalyzer or a DNA machine and uh, any of the scientific equipment used to produce evidence that they'll have CE marks or other labels on them saying they have been approved and that they're fit for purpose. Oh, absolutely. But, but so you know from your own experience of medical equipment that those yeah. things are, are not worth the paper they're written on because they're, uh, they're well, basically issued by, by organisations that, that have only had a budget to look at the documentation to see know, whether it's complete rather than whether it's correct. No, um, none of this is perfect, but to have the conformance standard stamped on the equipment is a start, and I doubt Fujitsu conform to any standards. I, I think the solution in, in many of those sorts of cases, you know, DNA checks or, or breathalyzers, is that um, you use a machine to maybe to identify an individual, and may, maybe this is, is also the answer to, to the challenge floor is raising about facial recognition. But you don't rely on, on the machine to actually give you the evidence for the conviction. So mm -hmm. in the case of a breathalyzer, for example, you, you use it as the first line, but then you, you take the person in and, and you get a, a blood or urine sample. And it's the blood or urine sample that provides the evidence. You know, in the mm -hmm. same way as 
as the police will use phone records to identify somebody and, and go and knock on their door. But if they don't, you know, it, it's, it's the swag that they find tucked under the bed in the flat that they've gone to that convicts the person, not the phone records. And, and of course, nobody found any swag in the sub-postmaster's houses. Absolutely. And, and that should have been... Um, so, you, so there was no situation. corroboration. There was no corroboration for her yes. husband. Yes. Exactly. Oh, the next Some judges question. were quite anxious about that. Mrs. The, the judge at Mrs. Misra's trial, despite the fact that um, she, she, the, the findings were made uh, and she was the, the jury uh, con convicted her, um, the, the judge was mindful that there was no uh, corroborative evidence. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I say that um, it's, it's, in a sense, it's a shame that the Court of Appeal didn't go into more detail about how these cases were actually handled in court, as opposed to the principal disclosure issues, which were the main reason for the uh, quashing of the convictions. Um, because it, it's perfectly obvious that in, in all these cases, well, the vast majority, almost almost without exception, there was no evidence that um, those those the defendants uh, had taken money, still less uh, enjoyed sort of um, questionable lifestyle benefits from, from what was alleged to have happened. Um, yeah. Thank you, Paul. Uh, next question comes from um, uh, Darcy Murphy. Uh, I'm interested in the idea of using known errors as a proxy for reliability. Does the paper go into the evidence for a link between known errors in a given computer system and actual errors? Mm -hmm. so, this was written by Darcy. It might be useful to let her read that paper and, and for us to pass on to another question, I think. Okay. Yeah, so I, I just, just one, one comment. I mean, it, it, it's, it's very difficult to, um, to deduce anything about the error density in a, in a system um, just from, from one set of errors that, that have occurred. Um, it, it may give you some insight into how professionally the system is being managed to be able to look at those records. In particular, of course, looking at the known errors gives you an insight into whether the system has got known errors that, that are directly relevant to the issue that's before the court at mm. the time. But um, e even trying to, to get any correlation from the error density in software, supposing you can find that, to the probability that the system will fail um, is, is a very, very difficult leap to make and one that, that academics are, have, have striven to, to try to get some kind of correlation without any success. And, and you can see why, it's because of the discrete nature of, of computer systems. They're, they're, not, they're not continuous fun functioning systems. And so you can, you, know, you can test them at their limits, but you can't infer anything about the behavior of the system between those limits. It's worth saying uh, the narrow log has got a, a, a very central part to play in the horizon story, but uh, no narrow logs or error logs um, aren't sufficient and they are often misleading because they themselves are subject to errors. Uh, in fact, one of the uh, articles in the electronic evidence journal that Stephen edits uh, tells a a story about Mike, Michael Rudkin, who was one of the postmasters, went into the offices of Fujitsu in the post office. And uh, I've got the paper here. Um, he overheard uh, one of the Fujitsu employers uh, messing around with a postmaster's account and said, I'll have to put it back, otherwise the postmaster's account will be short at the end of the day tonight. Uh, so that was a Fujitsu employee tinkering with the sub postmaster's account. That would not have been recorded as an error. The system was designed to allow that. And yet, had it not been returned by this Fujitsu employee, the sub postmaster would have been incriminated at the end of the day. Yeah. So the, the error logs hopefully tell you when there are errors, but they uh, can't tell you when there aren't errors. No, but the, the system, I mean, 
it, it's an accounting system. It's it's supposed to to balance properly. It's supposed to manage transactions and it's supposed to log and provide an audit trail for transactions so that the internal and if necessary external auditors can verify that the transactions have actually occurred appropriately mm. and I, I think you know one of, one of the things that went wrong in the in the post office horizon case was that um, as was completely inevitable, of course, the system operators, the, the people at the center managing the system and maintaining the system, had access to the databases and were able to make changes to all the, all the records if they needed to do so. Um, if, if they couldn't do that, they wouldn't have been able to do backups and restores or fix cyber attacks or you know, do any of the routine maintenance operations that it's their job to do. But the post office flatly denied that that was possible, that anybody could have made those changes. And, and that, you know, the court should never have, have accepted that because it, it's just blindingly obvious that that cannot possibly be the case. And, and yet, what that really requires is that those systems have got to log the actions that are taken by people who've got super user privileges, who've got those those particular access controls and, and are able to make those changes. Mm -hmm. And the logs that, that are, are um, recording the actions that are undertaken really ideally need to be, to be properly encrypted and properly locked down. I mean, it seems to me like a perfect um, example of something that ought to be on a blockchain. Mm, mm. It's, quite, yeah. it's quite extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, that one, one, one of the, the things in the Court of Appeal's judgment is that the Court of Appeal gives devotes a single sentence. It's in, in its entire judgment, which is one of the most important judgments given its subject matter. It devotes one sentence to the issue of remote access. But um, Mr. Justice Fraser, in his judgment, points out that the uh, that, that Fujitsu and the post office have been exercising these super user rights without recording either that those access rights were being exercised, still less what was being done by the use and exercise of those rights for about seven years. And then after seven years, it did keep records of rights being exercised, super, super user rights being exercised, uh, but not what was done. Uh, and, and what seems to me extraordinary about that is that in principle, that fact on its own, in any case where there is an, a question of um, missing uh, monies or shortfalls, um, in principle ought to undermine, and I'll be corrected by <laughs> floor on this, ought to undermine a prosecution case because you can't rule out that something was done uh, was the cause of the uh, shortfall rather than postmaster dishonesty. And it was only, I mean, the, the, the astonishing thing about this is that this was only in 2019 when a chap called Mr. Roll, Richard Roll, gave evidence at the Horizon Issues trial that he said, contrary to the post office case, that this was completely impossible and never been done. He said, well, not only was it possible, but I did it. And Mr. Roll was a former defense systems uh, technical uh, software designer uh, going back to a long time ago. Uh, and um, that, as it were, was that so far as <laughs> that issue was concerned. But, it, but the post office had held out brazenly since 2015. The point had been raised in the Panorama programme in 2015. And the post office had simply brazened it out, saying it wasn't possible. And they'd said that in Parliament to, to parliamentary select committees. It's quite extraordinary. I just wonder whether I might just myself canvas a question for Martin or, or, or um, Harold, um, given where we are. And, it, and th that's the question of end-to-end -end transactional uh, evidence uh, of a kind that was canvassed by Professor Jackson in his paper on um, computer evidence, i.e. The, 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 the possibility... Uh, sorry, I'll track back for those who are not familiar with this, but part, part of the problem with the prosecutions was the post office simply said, well, Horizon is reliable and it's robust. Please accept that, Judge. And they had people coming along to say, yes, that's absolutely the case. It's reliable and robust. So everybody nodded their heads. And that having been said and more or less accepted by the court, um, the detail of, of a particular transaction, that is 
its end-to-end -end integrity was never vouched. It was sort of just taken as an assumption. Uh, and Professor Jackson has written a very interesting paper saying, well, this, this is all just nonsense. One ought to be able to enter uh, uh, evidence in electronic form, uh, transactional integrity, just in the way that old fashioned accounts used to. You'd have the, the one side of the transaction, the other side in double entry bookkeeping. So you can actually see what's going on. Do, do, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sorry to sort of raise it in that way, but I mean, it seems to me that's quite an interesting point. Mm. I, I can see no reason why that that shouldn't be a, f a fundamental requirement of a, a computer-based accounting system. And why wouldn't you be recording all the transactions and and verifying that actually they were carrying out the the um, changes to the underlying accounts that they were supposed to be carrying out? It, mm. It's <laughs> I, I can't imagine how a, a designer could design a system that, that didn't do that and think that they were meeting the, the basic requirements that, that are laid down by, by the auditors, by, by you know, anybody trying to perform any kind of analysis of, and, and verification of the integrity of, of the financial accounts in, a, in an organization. Well. Well, let's broaden it out, though, a little, because what about if we're talking about something like facial recognition software? How do you demonstrate how you've uh, your um, your systems, thousands of cameras and and has decided that this particular person has cropped up enough times in enough places for you to say that they are potentially a criminal? How does that get? Uh, recorded in a way that is then uh, uh, disclosable in court. For, for me, Flora, you you broke up a bit, and maybe you did for other people. So I hope I'm answering your question. And uh, Martin and I are well. We'd like to think we're professional computer scientists. We're both professors, and blah blah blah. There are thousands of ways of doing this, and I, as a professor, teach undergraduate students how to correct errors and detect errors to handshake and check sums and blah, blah, blah. there are lots of ways of doing it and uh, many commercial programs I've worked with just don't do it because as you said earlier uh, we assume computers are infallible and a lot of people program as if they're infallible so if something goes wrong they have no idea what to do in the Princess of Wales case uh, I talked about earlier um, one of the things I regret never came up in court because the case collapsed for other reasons, which I talked about, was uh, some of the equipment the hospital was using was transmitting electronic data into the cloud, uh, going through um, commercial systems that change its format so it can from, talk from one system to another system because they use different formats, and it then ends up on the database. There was absolutely nothing to check that the stuff had actually got there as intended. It was just sent off into the cloud. And three different companies failed to check. Data went through their systems and came out the other end unaltered. It's just unbelievable. And I'm currently doing an investigation, which I can't say much about, uh, involving implants. So patients have got implants to manage their heart. And they're it's fantastic. It's amazing that you don't need to give them an operation. You can just put something on their chest and it will talk to the implant. And uh, in a death and in a serious injury, uh, which I'm looking at, uh, it's very clear that the transmitter doesn't check that the implant gets the messages it sent at all, let alone whether it gets them correctly or not. But like, how do you program like that? It's, it's just, it's, it's incompetent. It's incompetent, that's, that's absolutely right. I mean, facial recognition is, I mean, typically this is going, going to be done by, by a machine learning system. And, and machine learning systems have, have got serious problems in, in being able to demonstrate integrity. Um, because in, in the main, um, Firstly, you, you, you don't know what the training data looked like, and that, that leads to all kinds of distortions and biases in, in the, in the um, facial recognition. Um, but also, the, uh, 
the um, underlying behavior of, of a, um, a deep neural net is, is that uh, it, it may well be behaving in ways that even its designers can't explain or understand. And under those circumstances, I don't think you can give high reliance on, on the outputs without correlation again. I mean, if, if, you, if the system can, can find the pictures in the, in the, in the uh, history of, of the um, CCTV stream that it was scanning such that those individual pictures can then be looked at by a human and uh, a human can give some evidence about whether they are in fact the same person. Um, then you're, you're, you're back in, in the reality of something that we can deal with and you're not relying on the computer anymore. Okay, I will just uh, wrap up. There are um, two more questions, but three were raised from uh, the same person, so I will just uh, combine them. So Stuart Smiles uh, has three questions. The uh, latter was uh, what level of, of uh, accountability should be on the supplier and pass through to Fujitsu or underlying database products or contractors. Uh, and uh, also uh, Stuart asked, what should be the questions about mobile phone capture data sets, storage and access, cloud data searches, and what should be the quality of uh, uh, arms disclosure uh, requirements be? So these were the three questions uh, uh, mm -hmm. reason from Stuart. And then uh, maybe I will just uh, also uh, put forward the, the last one uh, that I can see from uh, Simon uh, Whiteley. Uh, please comment on the differences and similarities between probability of software failure versus the systematic fault. So these are the rem last main questions I can see. If, uh, um, well, I can have a, um, I can have a stab at, at, at talking about accountability between Fujitsu and the post office. Um, the simple answer to that is that's something that um, a group of us have recently um, submitted to the Williams inquiry as a proposed question. Um, it's very interesting to know what level of accountability uh, there was between Fujitsu and, and the post office. Um, one has to bear in mind that the post office is a wholly go owned government uh, institution. It's owned through UK government investments, which uh, um, the, the, the government is the sole shareholder of the post office. Um, but um, what, it, what is clearly known is that at the time the government uh, got this, if I can put it in those terms, got this uh, system to be taken on by um, uh, the post office under a management contract with Fujitsu, it was known to be insufficiently tested. Now, the, the, the way legally that the, the risk in Horizon was sought to be dealt with primarily mm -hmm. was to transfer the risk inherent in it mm -hmm. to the postmasters uh, by making them responsible effectively for showing what the fault was as an answer to a claim by, against them by the post office for any particular shortfall. It was basically down to them. And this is Mr. Justice Fraser's first judgment called the, the common issues judgment is concerned with the contractual arrangements. And the thing that did for Mr. Uh, Lee Castleton in 2006, 2007 judgment in January, 2007 was that um, the, the contract provided that the shortfall was by way of an account stated, which basically meant as a matter of law, to open it up, the, po the postmaster themselves had to show what the cause for the cause of the error was. It was a completely hopelessly impossible burden to discharge. And it was only in 2019 that Mr. Justice Fraser rumbled that in his Horizon Issues judgment. He said, well, whatever they call it, that's not what it is as a matter of law, because there was no agreement. Um, but um, and, and that's really when the, the locus of the risk in Horizon was removed from the postmaster and put back with the post office. Where it lies between the post office and Fujitsu at the moment is anybody's guess, I think. Well, other than that. Uh, thank you very much. I think it's uh, time to wrap up. Uh, there have been many questions, but uh, they can also be addressed uh, to BCS Law Specialist Group uh, and we could bring them to our speakers. I would like to thank very much uh, 
Paul, Laura, Martin, Harold, and Stephen. Harold, of course, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Can I ask a very quick question? Uh, uh, my chat has been scrolling up and I haven't read it. It's got lots of questions in it, but possibly if we answered those or have some sort of report or recording, uh, is it possible to distribute our response to the people who've been putting in questions and listening to our conversations? Yes. They, they, uh, probably need to give, they probably need to give permission for us to do that. The practice of the specialist group in previous events has been that uh, uh, when um, a, a time has been reached, we, we do have a record of the questions. I also kept a record of the chat. We can bring it uh, to you offline, and then there could be uh, some of the remaining ones answered and then distributed to our list. So this is something we can do. I mean, ha Harold, sorry, it's Sam here. I mean, to a certain extent, we can just anonymize the questions. I mean, you don't really know, need to know which particular person asked the question. So. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, well, I, we can I don't think. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can, I, can I just make a, a very brief point? Because it's just struck me very, very forcibly. Jason Coyne is on this call. And Jason Coyne was the expert for the claimants in the Horizon Issues trial, uh, whose evidence was a, a, accepted by uh, Mr. Justice Fraser. And he's just made an interesting observation, which I think we share on the chat, namely that the known error log. Uh, was was what we asked for initially before we knew the name of any back office quality systems at Fujitsu. It did not really exist as a single document. It was a suite of many different error logging fault man uh, management systems covering different aspects with gaps and overlaps. So that's an interesting point and I think quite help, helpful for my understanding um, and it may be for, for, for others. And uh, Jason, thanks for, for making that contribution. Thank you very much. Uh... Patagonia, I will now sum up um, for us to close down, I think. Um, what I want to say very briefly is, is that um, uh, somebody did mention that the post office was a private prosecution. That indeed is correct. But uh, in uh, talks with uh, Crown prosecutors who work for the Crown Prosecution Service at a very high level, I do know for certain that uh, in private conversations, they want the presumption to remain because it's convenient for them but also they want it to remain because defence lawyers are so ignorant about electronic evidence and that helps with prosecutions. This is a crucial thing that actually is fundamentally important and must be remembered. For those people who do not know, I managed to buy, I got the permission of the trial judge in the case of Seema Misra to buy a copy of the transcript of the trial before it was deleted. And I published it in 2015 in my journal. So the full trial of the Seba Misra case is available and it was also published with her, her written agreement. I have three final points to say. First of all, it is necessary for would-be lawyers to be educated in electronic, electronic evidence. I called for this in 2010, see my editorial, and the talks by Paul and Flora served to emphasize this requirement. The links to the relevant articles, I asked Denise Wong from Singapore and Deborah Capps from the UK to write articles about it, and you will find both of them to be very, very useful. The practical solution proposed by Deverell Capps, I think it would one be one that would suit this jurisdiction. Secondly, in the 2010 second edition of Electronic Evidence, after I represented Job in uh, pro bono in 2007 on, a, on an ATM case, I called for the end of the presumption that computers are reliable in the chapter dealing with this presumption. As indicated by Harold, the post office case is not unique and there are plenty of examples in that chapter of the errors of IT systems. And I also um, point out that the resources provided include Harold's article that we provided, um, which I published in 2018 on the nurses case. Please do read that. Now in researching this topic as a lawyer for over 10 years, I have not found a single judge in any jurisdiction define what they, might, they mean by reliable when they claim computers are reliable. And incidentally, the cases mentioned by Paul in his talk are also included in that chapter for obvious reasons. So I am very glad that the British Computer Society has finally reached the conclusion that it ought to be revised. Uh, and they have the press release dated 28th of May, 2021. But I have a question. Why has it taken you so long to reach this conclusion? And I 
have a final point. And I leave the British Computer Science Society with another question. When the Law Commission published its report in 1997, why did the British Computer Society not challenge this presumption? Now, maybe having listened to Martin again and the paper that um, was presented, uh, um, which, which, we, which I published earlier this year on some of the practical problems that could be dealt with, with with regard to disclosure, perhaps it is now time for the British Computer Society to work with Martin, Harold and others on actually dealing with this and advising the government accordingly, including a suitable number of lawyers as well. So it remains for me to say thank you very much for uh, Paul and Flora, Harold and Martin giving their time this evening uh, to discuss these issues. We all know this is a, a pitifully short period of time. We have overrun, which is fine. And it's a great shame we obviously can't do this in person. But let's hope this is not the end of the matter. Let's hope it's just the beginning. Thank you very much to the British Computer Society for organising this event. It's much appreciated. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Th thank you, Stephen. Uh, in relation to the questions, uh, I don't think anyone can sort of answer those questions, but as a trustee of the British Computer Society, I'll take it to the board and let's sort of uh, convene offline, yeah, and to mm -hmm. explore this further. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, thank you, Paul, uh, Martin, Harold, uh, Stephen and Flora uh, for your valuable contribution. I'm sure all the attendees enjoyed it. And yeah, have a have a good evening all. And yeah, for the other for the attendees who joined, uh, stay tuned for sort of the next events that we will be hosting. So uh, good night and keep safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.